So in this session, I'll present our work on anonymous attestation with subverted TPMs, which is joint effort with Jan Kamenisch and Anja Lehmann. So if you, um, if you look at a computer nowadays, then typically it has a TPM embedded in it, a trusted platform module. This is a, a tamper-resistant piece of hardware designed to um, create secure cryptographic keys and store them in a secure manner and use them in a secure manner. And what it can also do is um, it can observe the state of the host system, so the laptop in which the TPM is embedded. And um, an example of this is if, uh, if the laptop starts up during the boot sequence, then the TPM can observe which software is being loaded onto the TPM to end up with sort of a report of which software uh, the, the, the laptop started. And now it might be interesting to perform remote attestation using this. So the TPM will convince a remote verifier that the, the laptop uh, started some certain good software. So it's not running malware, but it's running whatever we expect it's running. Um, for example, if we look at a, a corporate network, you might want to let laptops first attest that they're running secure software before you let them onto the network. So this process is called remote attestation. And typically, this is a two-phase um, process. First, we need to do some. Um, some registration step, the join phase, in which the, the platform, so the host and the, the TPM together, talk to some issuer, that this is some authority in the system, uh, to obtain some one-time setup. Uh, it obtains some membership credential. After that, we, the, the platform can sign attestations. So it can give a verifier some, some cryptographic proof that, uh, that some TPM measurement is, is correct. So in our example of the secure boot sequence, the TPM can convince a remote verifier that the laptop started the correct software. So we can do this with standard signatures and standard X5 and N credentials, but then there will be one problem, and that is that you're linkable. So whenever you um, uh, send such an attestation to, uh, to a verifier, he will see the TPM's identity and it's, he, can, he can follow you around. So if you, if you do these attestations to many different uh, verifiers, then your privacy will be lost. So to, to, um, to prevent this, people came up with direct anonymous attestation, or DAA. And this works the same as the remote attestation that I described earlier, but now the attestations are anonymous. So they don't reveal anything about the platform in question. So this direct anonymous attestation was introduced in 2004 by Brickell, Kamenich, and Chen. And um, that was made for the TPM 1.2 standard. So, and during that time, there was also some privacy concerns about, about the, uh, the effect of putting some, some chip in your computer that can, can see what you're doing. So to address those concerns, DAA was also introduced and included in that standard. Then later, the TPM 2.0 standard came around, and that included support for different anonymous attestation schemes, but it still uh, supported this. And since then, um, this has been standardized by ISO and hundreds of millions of TPMs have been sold, so this is quite a large deployment of a cryptographic scheme. And there's also interest from other angles. Um, for example, the FIDO Alliance. This is an industry alliance that's trying to standardize passwordless authentication, and um, they use anonymous attestation to attest that a certain cryptographic key is securely stored. And also Intel's SGX, their trusted execution environment, is using uh, a variation on DAA to uh, as, as their remote attestation mechanism. And finally, you can see DAA as a special form of anonymous credentials where you have a security device that handles your key. Um, so this is relevant for, for many different, uh, different areas. So let's look at the security of DAA. This is a sort of signature scheme. So of course, we need a form of unforgeability. And in particular, uh, we, we consider a corrupt host, so a corrupt laptop, that can talk to a to an honest TPM embedded in it. And it can uh, make many attestations on messages, and then we want to prevent it from coming up by itself on an attestation of a new message, which a TPM never approved. So in our example about trusted boot, this means that if we have a corrupt laptop running the wrong software, it cannot come up with an attestation that it's in fact running the right software. And second, we need anonymity. This is why, we, why we're using DAA. And uh, the anonymity requirement that we have is that the verifier cannot see, uh, given an attestation, does not know to whom it belongs. 
or more precisely, if you give it two different attestations, it cannot even tell if it's from the same platform or from two different platforms. And in this, uh, this we want this property to hold even if the issuer, so this, this, this uh, authority in the scheme, is corrupt. So even if he tries to give us bad uh, credentials and is colluding with the verifier, even then we want the anonymity to hold. So that's very good, but there's one surprising thing here. And that is that in, this, in, the, in all the definitions of anonymity, uh, we trust the TPM. We trust that the TPM follows the protocol. And this is, this is not what you would expect, because one of the reasons to introduce DAA was to uh, address the privacy concerns of some chip. People don't trust this chip, and, uh, but now the, the, the notion of privacy requires us to trust that chip in the first place. And, um, and in fact, also recent uh, revelations have shown that it's very uh, naive to trust that some piece of hardware running some crypto, to trust that for your privacy, this is quite naive and is not what you would expect from a security definition. And um, so in, in, in different fields in cryptography, people looked at sort of subversion resilience or what, what, what security can I have if, if I run the wrong algorithms. And we want to do something here in the same, in the same uh, direction. So, so in this talk, we're going to look at can we do anonymous attestation where we have privacy even if the TPM is corrupt or even if the TPM is not following protocol. So let's look at the existing security definition of DAA. The most recent definition is in the UC framework, so it's an ideal functionality. And I'll show you how signing works and how it guarantees uh, anonymity. So the host starts to sign a message, so he gives the ideal functionality the instruction that he wants to sign the message M. Then the TPM must approve the message, and if the TPM approves, then the functionality will perform some checks. First, it sees whether this platform has, has performed the registration steps that, uh, that I talked about earlier, and then it will output a signature. And if the TPM is honest, it needs to output an anonymous signature, because this is how we define the anonymity here. And to make an anonymous signature, we use local computation in the functionality. So the functionality has some algorithms embedded in it to compute something that looks like a signature. And now how we um, guarantee that what the signature that we output is anonymous is by only giving the message to the algorithm. We don't give anything that depends on the identity of the platform to this algorithm. And that means that the resulting value cannot depend on the identity of the platform. So that means the signature will be dis distributed equally for regardless of who, who is signing at this point. And that guarantees anonymity. And of course, a verifier can use, the, can use the functionality to verify, and that's where we guarantee unforgeability, but I won't go into detail there. Okay, so this, this is the existing, existing uh, functionality, so this guarantees an anonymous signature if the TPM is honest. Now we want to strengthen this to uh, come up with a functionality that uh, also guarantees this when the TPM is corrupt. So in first, um, the first good guess is to uh, we had this check that we only output an anonymous signature if the TPM is honest. Now we're going to do that even if the TPM is corrupt. But this is not enough yet. Because if we consider the security model that we're, that we're trying to achieve, that means that everybody is corrupt except the host computer. And now corruptions are typically modeled in a way that if a party is corrupt, that means that the adversary, one central adversary, controls all the corrupt parties. And you see on the left that that the, that the adversary who, is, who has corrupted the TPM sees which, which message a certain TPM is signing. So it knows exactly which messages the TPM has signed. And now if that, if that message, if, if we're not all signing the same message, but if that message is somewhat unique, then of course if the verifier, if a corrupt verifier then sees a signature on that message, it knows that it was me. So we don't have privacy unless we're all signing the same message. Um, so, we could, we could try to prevent the adversary, so we could prevent the adversary from seeing which messages the TPM is signing by not giving the message to the, to, the, to the TPM. But this prevents us from having a meaningful definition of unforgeability. Because remember, remember in unforgeability, we need the TPM to approve the signing of messages. So this does not work, and we cannot, we cannot realize a meaningful definition of privacy here. But in fact, the corruption that we're modeling here is very strong. 
Here we model a TPM which is uh, controlled by a central adversary. However, in the, the attack that we more envision is that a TPM is running bad algorithms or taking bad randomness, uh, but that is still a local piece of hardware in my laptop. So we need to refine our corruption model. So now we put the adversary in the TPM in a jail cell. We limit his capabilities here. Um, the UC framework allows us to, to uh, define fine-grained uh, uh, corruption models. And what we do here is that we say that the adversary can define bad behavior for the TPM, but it's limited to, to that. It's not controlled by one central adversary. Um, we can do this using this body shell uh, paradigm that they use. And um, this way, the TPM, even though it approves messages and can have bad influence there, it is not controlled by the central adversary, so the central adversary does not see every message that we're signing. And we think this is optimal privacy. This is the strongest privacy model that we could hope for. Um, so we want to achieve this level of privacy. And in the real world, we, we're then in the same situation. So the TPM is a local corrupt algorithm in my computer, uh, but it's not controlled by the central adversary, where the verifier and the issuer are still colluding and uh, corrupt. So this is, our, this is our new security model that we want to achieve. Now we have to look at how we can achieve this using protocols. So first, let's look at existing protocols and how far we are. And all uh, existing protocols use the same, the same approach of, uh, uh, you use the same common approach. That is that the TPM holds a secret key. This is the only key that the, the platform has. And during this, this setup phase, during the join phase, um, they authenticate to the issuer, and the issuer places uh, a signature on a commitment to the TPM key. This is called the membership credential. Um, after that, we can make such attestations, and an attestation is a zero-knowledge proof, proving that a message was signed with a TPM key that is certified by the issuer. So this is what all, all existing schemes follow, and uh, the differences are in which signature scheme you use to make such a credential, or how you instantiate the zero-knowledge proof, but other than that, they're all the same. And unfortunately, none of them are good enough to realize our notion of privacy. For two reasons, actually. The first reason is that this zero-knowledge proof, that is the attestation, um, is a statement about the TPM secret key, meaning that um, the TPM and the host must together make the zero-knowledge proof. The host cannot do it by himself because he doesn't know this key. And that means that if we have a corrupt TPM, uh, he might give some malicious contribution to the zero-knowledge proof, uh, rendering the whole zero-knowledge proof no longer honestly generated. So we cannot claim any zero-knowledge uh, ab about this proof. Uh, and the second is that the key, all the key material is, is, is stored by the TPM. And if the TPM is malicious, that means that we have no good key material left. And again, that, that means we cannot have the anonymity properties that we want to have. So we come up with a new approach where we address exactly these two concerns. So the first change is that we no longer only have a TPM secret key, we also have a TPM corresponding public key. And instead of signing the secret key in this membership credential, we put the public key in there. And that means that the zero knowledge statement that's that we prove, which is the attestation, uh, is no longer a statement about the TPM secret key, but about the TPM public key. And the host knows that. So the host can create this full zero knowledge proof. And because the host is honest, we, we know that we actually have created a proper zero knowledge proof. The second change um, is, that, is that we split the key of the, uh, the, we no longer only have a key of a TPM, but we split that into two parts. The host and the TPM together create the key. That means that even if the TPM is malicious uh, and creates a bad key, the host adds enough good key to, to come up with a, with a proper key of the platform altogether. So this, this new approach, we show that we can, with this approach, we show that we can realize the, uh, the level of privacy that we, that we previously defined. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a bit more detail here. So we, we, we specify, um, uh, three building blocks that we need um, to, to reflect the, the, the picture I showed you in the previous slide. Um, and with those three building blocks, if we give secure instantiations, those give us a secure DAA scheme. 
The first thing is, is, is a split signature. This is uh, very similar to uh, multi-signatures or client-server signatures and allows the TPM and the host to, to make a signature together uh, with their individual key shares. So this is similar to existing, existing uh, notions of multi-signatures, but we need some extra properties. The first is that um, a signature should not reveal anything about the public key under which it's valid, because that would destroy the privacy that we're looking for. And the second is we need some uniqueness properties. We need that the signature is unique for a certain key in a message, and that uh, um, given a signature, only one key, uh, given a signature in a message, it can only be valid under one key. And these uniqueness properties um, limit the way in, uh, in which an adversary can have malicious influence. Because there's not so many choices he can make, this makes it easier to prove the anonymity that we want to have. And in fact, we, can, we present that we, can, that we can efficiently instantiate this based on BLS signatures. Second, we use uh, signatures on encrypted messages to form the credential of the, uh, of the platform. And here, we present an efficient instantiation based on AGOT structure-preserving signatures on LGML ciphertext. And finally, we need the zero-knowledge proofs or zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge to glue everything together and um, one efficient instantiation is uh, based on Schnorr proofs, possibly with the CRS trapdoor. And um, so we show that any secure instantiation of these building blocks that fulfill the properties that we need uh, yields a secure DEA protocol. But if you use the efficient instantiation that we propose, then we actually get a very efficient and practical DEA protocol. Um, signing only takes nine instantiations and 10 pairings for the host which can run, be run in tens of milliseconds. And more importantly, the TPM only has to compute two exponentiations uh, to make an attestation. And of course, here it's important to realize that the TPM is orders of magnitude slower than the host computer. Um, so you want to minimize the workload for the TPM. And this will have the greatest influence on the efficiency of the DEA scheme. And actually, this is the most efficient DEA protocol uh, f in, in terms of the DAA, of, of the TPM signing operation that there is so far. So that makes this actually very practical. And verification only takes four exponentiations and eight pairings. Um, so that makes this, this uh, that shows that we can very efficiently do this. So to wrap up, we show that, um, that the anonymity definitions that we have used over the last decade for DAA are not what we expect it to be. Um, even though the point was to um, reduce trust in the TPM, we actually still needed it to be, to be honest for any anonymity. And now we showed, or now we define that, uh, uh, we define DEA with optimal privacy, so we define the best privacy we can hope for in the form of a UC functionality, and we show how to model such a subversion attack on a TPM in this framework. Um, then we, we define a new approach to DAA protocols because uh, the existing schemes do, are not sufficient to realize this notion of privacy. We define a new approach um, that we can use to realize this, uh, that we can re realize our ideal functionality. And we give a very efficient protocol, that, uh, a very efficient concrete instantiation uh, that can actually be used in practice. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions.